Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webcast, How to Perform an Aerodynamic Analysis with SOLIDWORKS Flow Simulation. Today's demonstration is basically a, an external flow analysis. Uh, this is part four of a four-part series on SOLIDWORKS Flow Simulation. Uh, we will be recording it in case you miss any of it, in case you want to review, or if you want to share with a colleague who wasn't able to join today. Uh, these videos will be uh, posted on our YouTube channel. I'll uh, share that link at the end of the presentation. So this is who I am. My name is Ken Victor. I'm a senior application engineer here at Fish Unitech. I currently have just finished my 15th year of experience with Fish Unitech. I also have 20 years experience with SOLIDWORKS. Uh, in a previous life, I uh, worked as a machine designer, as I have both uh, a bachelor's in mechanical engineering and a master's in systems engineering as well. Uh, one of my proud achievements is uh, being one of the first 10 to achieve elite AE status. Uh, that's uh, the highest uh, achievement that I can get as an application engineer. Uh, basically, it requires many uh, certifications in SOLIDWORKS, simulation, and across all of our portfolio. Now, before we get started with the actual demonstration, for those who are new uh, to this webcast series, uh, for those who are new to Flow, I'd like to talk to SOLIDWORKS Flow Simulation at a high level, kind of talk about what we uh, can get, how Flow is bundled, and uh, <clears throat> kind of keep it at a high level for the benefit of those that may be visiting us uh, for the first time. For those who have seen the other series, who've uh, been in some training or may have seen a demo, uh, some of this will be a refresher. Uh, in all honesty, you know, when it comes to fluid flow, whether it's an internal analysis, external, uh, like some of our other series, um, PCB with thermal, you know, a lot of the, the setup is the same. A lot of the content is the same. Uh, so, again, for, for those, that, it might be a little bit of a fresher for you. So let's talk about the... <clears throat> SOLIDWORKS Flow Bundle, basically it, it stands on its own. It's not part of any other simulation bundle. Uh, as you can see here, it, it's one of many tools in our simulation portfolio. Now, within Flow, you do have a couple of uh, add-ons. Um, these do require Flow, but you can get them uh, in addition and that's the electronics cooling module and the HVAC module. I will uh, talk a little bit more about those uh, in a little bit. But this is what we're talking about. It is uh, a standalone, but just to, to make everybody aware, uh, it is built right inside of SOLIDWORKS. So it's not a separate interface. Uh, you're using the same uh, SOLIDWORKS interface for your flow uh, uh, problems. So what is flow? Basically, it's our computational fluid dynamic solution. Uh, like I said, built right inside of SOLIDWORKS. We don't need to export. We don't have to import uh, into another tool. We don't have to learn another interface. And, and that, to me, is one of the biggest benefits of our SOLIDWORKS flow simulation. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of people find that you know, having to, to do all that importing, exporting takes a long time. If I can do it right inside of SOLIDWORKS, yeah, we're, we're going to be able to save a, a lot of that uh, process time. So for anybody designing products related to the flow of, of gases or liquids, if you're looking at heat transfer, conduction, convection, radiation, if you're looking at extracting pressure loads from a, a flow analysis, then this is uh, the design tool for you. And <clears throat> we're going to show here a short list uh, of a much bigger list of, of everything we can do within flow. So first and foremost, 
we can study incompressible fluids or compressible fluids. We can look at external problems like we're going to do today, or we can look at internal problems like through a manifold. We can include non-Newtonian uh, fluid flows. We can include forced, free, or mixed convection. Uh, conjugate heat transfer, looking at conduction, convection, radiation effects. We have a porous media option for anybody that's designing filters or using filters in their fluid flow problems. And finally, we can uh, look at time dependent versus steady state uh, fluid problems as well. Again, a short list of, of some of the things we can do within flow simulation. Some, uh, some of the quick examples that we have, we've got uh, flow through this cy cyclone assembly. Whoops. We've got flow through these manifolds, uh, looking at exhaust gas, how it combines with uh, air. And here you're looking at a mass fraction plot, so the mass fraction of the exhaust air as it combines with, uh, <clears throat> with the incoming air that you see there in blue. Here's an example of flow through an e e uh, electronics enclosure. An external flow similar to what we're going to see today around uh, a vehicle. And finally, an example of a flow analysis where we extract the results, import them into simulation, and perform a static analysis right, for stresses and displacements on the, the files that the, the flow field is uh, coming in contact with. The two modules I mentioned, there's the flow electronics cooling module for the electronics industry. Uh, this has additional capabilities, <clears throat> including a two resistor component model, joule heating, a heat pipe model, PCB generator, and an updated library or expanded library. Again, you need to have flow to be able to get the electronics cooling module. And the HVAC module or HVAC module, this is for designers <clears throat> uh, simulating or designing cooling systems, uh, heating systems, large-scale room environments like the one you see there on the PowerPoint. Uh, if, if you're interested in what we call comfort parameters, then the HVAC module is for you. That also has some advanced radiation tools and, once again, an updated uh, or expanded library for those types of uh, analysis. All right, so today's agenda, taking a look at an external analysis on a semi-truck and trailer. <clears throat> we want to determine the effectiveness of some of the components that uh, you may have seen. I know one uh, you all see, the fairing. How does that affect the, uh, the load, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, drag force on the vehicle? In addition to that, we want to take a look at the skirt. How effective is that? on the, the force of the vehicle. And the tail that you can't really see too well at this point, what is its effectiveness on uh, the, the air velocity? So that's kind of what we're gonna look at. Um, this isn't a, a benchmark that I've done, but it is one that I've followed from one of our colleagues. Uh, I've always been interested in knowing, you know, how effective is that fairing? You know, it, it seems like it's, something that must be pretty effective. I see them on most uh, semi-trailers now, but uh, certainly the skirt and tail, I don't see as often. Um, I have seen them on occasion, but those are the ones I've, I've always been even more interested in. You know, what do they do? How do they affect that, that force? And uh, this benchmark kind of 
showcases a, a little bit of that with an external analysis. Now, as I get going here, just to let everybody know, if you have any questions along the way, feel free to use the Q&A panel. Uh, drop in your questions, and as soon as I see them, or maybe at the end of the seminar, I'll address all of those, uh, those questions. All right, so let's get to it. So right now you're seeing a, a table of effectiveness or the, the goal of the problem, which is the drag force on the semi truck and trailer. And then you see a, a row of percent change. All right, so on the far left, we're looking at the results already for an analysis that looks at all three aerodynamic components, the fairing, the skirt, and the tail. All right, and after running that analysis, we found uh, approximately 682 uh, pounds of force on the semi-truck. So to determine the effectiveness of the fairing, what we did next is we removed the fairing. So that's actually the last column. We ran the analysis and looked at the drag force and that gave us a percent change. We turned that back on and turned off the skirt. So that's the second to last column. We ran the analysis, looked at its effectiveness. And then finally, oh no, I'm sorry. Uh, from there, we turned back on the skirt, turned off the tail and calculated its force. And then finally, we turned off everything. So no aerodynamic dynamic components, no fairing skirt or tail, we ran the analysis and looked at those results. So while I go through this, if you can uh, maybe come up with uh, some thoughts, what are your ideas on the effectiveness, what that percent change is gonna be in force, we'll showcase those results here in a bit. All right, so let's jump into it. Let me switch over to SolidWorks here and you will see the semi truck and trailer. Now this model was simplified. This actually was created as a part file. So one of the first steps in flow is taking your models, your designs and simplifying. Uh, in this case, we could have taken the, uh, the assembly and meshed and ran the analysis on the entire assembly, but you're looking at much larger run times uh, as, as the mesh gets more complicated, the, the run times go up. And uh, with, with this already running about a, an hour to two hours, uh, we wanted uh, to, to keep that runtime to a minimum. So as I do a, a quick section clip here, you can see, yes, indeed, this is a part file. But it works just as well as the actual assembly. Uh, next up, creating the configurations that represent the different uh, vehicles or components that we want to analyze. So the, the first, the default here is looking at all aerodynamic components. So we can see the fairing, the skirt, and the tail. Then a configuration was created, and it's simple, uh, as simple as right-clicking and selecting Add Configuration to create a configuration with no fairing. So with that configuration active, basically we just turn off that feature. Uh, you'll notice my colors change. I only colored the all arrow configuration. I didn't bother with the others. So the no skirt configuration turned back on the fairing. So it unsuppressed that and then suppressed the skirt. Then the no tail configuration that unsuppresses the skirt and suppresses the tail at the back. And then finally going old school, no fairing, skirt or tail. All right, next up, turning on flow. Basically going to our add-ins, checking the, the button, and once flow is added in, you're going to get a flow simulation tab slash toolbar, a 
an analysis prep tab if you need additional help prepping your models. And then under the tools pull down menu, you'll see a, a sub pull down menu for flow simulation where you'll find all of your flow commands. Now the projects that we create are configuration specific, so you activate the configuration prior to setting up your project. And typically we do that by using the wizard. So any starting point to setting up a project, going through the wizard. So I'll go, I'll go, through, uh, go through this, even though we've got all of the setup and we've got the results, I'll still go through uh, an example of setting it all up. So the first page of the wizard is basically giving it a project name. So this would be called all arrow and I've already got a, a study. So I'm just going to give it the name too. You choose which configuration you want. I'll just go with the current, which is all arrow and you hit next. The next page is where you define the units. With this, you can mix and match units. For example, my velocity, my vehicle is going at 70 miles per hour. So I'm going to switch this to miles per hour. If it's one or two units that are changing, I'll just do it on the fly. You can see as I hit the pull down there, I've got units for everything within flow. If it's several items that I'm changing, then I might create a new system of units. So I make my changes, I hit this option, give it a name, and then at that point uh, I have my own system of units I can use next time. Once you're done there, you hit next, and that takes us to our analysis type and some of the different physical features that we can take advantage of. So here we're talking about an external analysis. To the right of that, if you are using the actual assembly, there are options to exclude cavities without flow conditions or excluding internal spaces. For example, the inside of the trailer of my semi truck, we could exclude that space so it's not being mashed. There's no calculations happening there. Otherwise, underneath that, we have some different physical features. We can turn on conduction, radiation effects. If it's a time dependent or transient analysis, we can specify that. If buoyancy effects are important, we can turn on gravity. If you're analyzing impellers, uh, fan blades, that type of thing, we can take advantage of our rotational frame of reference option. And then if you're looking at a free surface, think of uh, a dam that's holding back water, you all of a sudden remove the dam and you wanna see where that water goes, uh, you can take advantage of our free surface option. None of those apply here, so I'll hit next and move on to the default fluids. Here we've got a pretty good database of gases and liquids, some non-Antonian liquids, compressible, real gases, etc. If it's something in there, simply double click and add it to the project fluid. If it's not in there, if you have a gas that you need to create, you can certainly hit new find your way to our engineering database and create your own. So I'll just select on the predefined so you can see some of the ones that are there. And as I click on, let's say air and go to properties, you can see the properties that were defined for that material, for that fluid. And that's it, you hit save, close out of the database and select the material. All right, once you're Fluid is selected. Underneath, we have some additional flow characteristics that you could include, like the flow type. If it's laminar only, you can choose that. If it's turbulent only, you can choose that. Uh, if you're not knowing, you can leave it on laminar and turbulent. There's a high Mach number flow option, and you can turn on humidity uh, input and results as well. None of those apply, so I'll hit next. And here we find the default wall conditions. Okay, so the walls typically on an internal analysis, a pipe, you know, maybe you're specifying a heat flux or transfer rate through that pipe. Maybe you want to give it a wall temperature. 
Okay, the default is just an adiabatic wall, no, no heat transferring uh, or no wall condition, so to speak. Then underneath that, you have a roughness value, again, typically for internal analysis, you know, like a valve or a machine component. If it's machined rather roughly, you can include that micro inch setting or value to uh, account for that. Don't really apply on my uh, external analysis, so I'm just going to hit next. And the final page in the wizard, the initial and ambient conditions. If you know the uh, initial conditions, if you type them in here, you're going to uh, get to your end result much quicker. For me, I can use this to specify my velocity. For an external analysis, I typically use the wizard to specify just that. So here in the X direction, you can see the little triad down here. That's the direction of the air as the vehicle moves 70 miles per hour. So I'll type that in and hit finish. At that point, as I click over here to the flow simulation analysis tab, it creates my project. Now you can see there are several projects already here, all based on the individual configurations that we created earlier. This is where we got all results. For this, uh, this webcast, we're just gonna look at the all aero uh, setup and results, <clears throat> at least as far as uh, SOLIDWORKS is concerned. But we'll see the results on all the configurations when we get back to the PowerPoint. All right, so below the, the project tree, you have the individual project uh, projects themselves. So here's all arrow two. Um, as I right click, I'll access, I'll gain access to my shortcut menus. And if I go to customize tree, that's where I find all the additional tools within flow. So if I'm dealing with fans, porous media, perforated plates. If I've got heat sources that I need to include, this is where you turn them off. I like this because I can keep my tree pretty clean. If I don't need any of that, I leave it off and just work with uh, the icons that uh, I do need. So the first step after the wizard in, I guess you could say finalizing the, uh, the external setup, looking at the computational domain. So the, the computational domain is that domain that gets meshed and run. And for internal analysis, it automatically envelopes the internal space. For external analysis, it automatically distances itself from your uh, components. Now, in a lot of cases, it kind of distances itself quite a ways from the components, more than I usually like. And that's because SOLIDWORKS doesn't want to be responsible for bad results. So typically, at that point, I'm moving that computational domain in. Just a matter of preference. You can move the arrows like I'm doing here or you can edit the definition and adjust the size and conditions through the uh, input cells there. This is also where we can take advantage of symmetry. Okay, from their boundary conditions. Now, my boundary conditions are all there. I've only got the one and that's the air velocity 70 miles per hour or to simulate the air velocity. But if I needed to, I could right click and insert additional boundary conditions. So for internal analysis, where you've got a flow rate coming into the uh, problem, you can define a mass flow rate, mass flux, volume flow rate, and velocity. You can define a pressure opening and you can define a wall setting. And I might show an example of that later on. All right, none of it applies. Just wanted to point it out. <clears throat> so that brings us to the next step, creating our goals. And goals serve two purposes. First and foremost, they are areas of interest, results of interest that we're after. So the drag force, the force acting on the semi-truck, for example. Another goal for some doing external analysis, the drag coefficient, 
another very popular result that you might need to compare from one design to the next. So let's, uh, let's add these goals. We have different options. We've got global goals. So the force in the X direction, for example. We've got surface goals. So goals pertaining to a surface, point goals, volume goals, and equation goals. So let's get our force X option. And that's all there is to it. The other purpose for goals is for convergence process or purposes. So when uh, the solver is calculating, when those goals reach convergence, that's the, the indication that, yeah, you can stop running. All right now, the drag coefficient we're going to set up as an equation goal. So the drag force equation. Uh, is basically the, the force equal to one-half the drag coefficient times the density of the fluid times the velocity of the fluid squared. So all you do here is you set up that expression for the drag coefficient. Right? So if you rearrange that, you've got the force in the x, and we can choose that up here to add it to our expression, times 2. So you can use the calculator down below, or you can use the keyboard as well. Divided by the density. Divided by the area. So that's part of the equation as well, the area that uh, the force is seeing. divided by the velocity squared. And that's it. And that's how you set up equation goals. Another great use for an equation goal is pressure drop through a pipe. And you can set up a global or a surface goal on one end, that's pressure, a surface goal on the other end, that's pressure, and then do an equation goal, pressure one minus pressure two to get a, a pressure drop result. All right, and that's it. Next up is meshing. So here we've got uh, some different options for setting up the mesh. We've got the automatic settings, which are good enough for probably 80% of your problems out there. Uh, but for the other 20%, we've got manual settings as well. For the automatic settings, you've got this slider. This is your level of initial mesh. As you go from left to right, you're increasing the cell count. Down below that, you've got some options for, for minimum gap size, again, to help create a more appropriate mesh for smaller gaps, and also you know, throughout the, uh, the, the boundary. And then an option to close up thin slots. If you have, let's say, a sheet metal part with a little slot that's kind of just getting in the way, you really don't need to see the flow going through that, you can uh, treat that as a, a thin slot, give it a little tolerance here, and it'll ignore flow through those areas. Now, for these problems, my external analysis on the semi truck. We basically went with a level of initial mesh of five. And that was it. Did not use the manual settings, but here they are. Being able to apply a different number of cells in the X, Y, or Z. Refining cells all throughout the fluid region, or maybe along the fluid solid boundary region. Defining what uh, a small channel is and refining the elements through that channel. Advanced refinement looks at refining small features, refining based on a curvature, a tight uh, curvature criterion that you apply, and a, a tolerance level. All 
right? And then it's time to run. Now I'm not going to actually run this. It took me just under two hours to run this problem. I believe the, the gentleman who did the original benchmark, he said he took a little under an hour. He has a much more powerful computer or had where I'm simply using my laptop to do this. Now, as you run, you do get this solver window with a lot of good information as it's running. So this is a screenshot I took of a, another problem, another flow problem. And as you can see over here on the left-hand side, we've got this information, right? So the total number of cells, the CPU time, number of travels, the calculation time left, that type of information. Next door to that, you've got a preview. These are nice because I can see what my flow is doing. I can see how it's developing prior to finishing the, uh, the analysis. The benefit there is if I see something wrong, if I see velocities, pressures that shouldn't be there or aren't what I'm expecting, well, I can stop the analysis without having to wait until the very end. To the right of that, we've got some goal plots, right? We can actually see our goals converge or not converge. We can see the progression. In the lower left, more of the same. Uh, this kind of just is a repeat of what you see in the goal plot, a list of the goals and their progression. And then finally, to the right of that, an event log, just telling you, you know, when things started, when things ended, if there's any, um, oh, warnings are up here. I was going to say if there's any warnings, it would say that, but that's actually under the information window as well. This solver window is customizable. You can turn things off, turn things on as you need them. Make them big like I've got, make them real small, make, turn them into tabs. But uh, yeah. Oops. All right, I think that's it. Let's take a look at results. Now I'm going to go back to the one I've already calculated. The results are already loaded. And I've got results already created for us as well. Now the first result, a couple of cut plots. It's real simple. Any one of these, we right click and insert. And you walk through the options for what you want to see. Okay. I'm going to just edit the definition of what I already have. So this first one is just looking at the mesh. So using the, the face that you see here, the mesh option, hitting the green check mark, and there you go. The second one looks at these nice colorful contours using our pressure and these streamlines using velocity as uh, the parameter. And as I hit the green check mark there, we get a real good feel for what the fluid is doing and where it's going. So the air, as it hits the front of the vehicle, where it's traveling, where we might have some recirculation, all that good stuff. And the nice thing with streamlines, as you can see, as I zoom in, they get more dense. I zoom out, they get less dense. <clears throat> so we're looking at, uh, you know, an, an overall view of what our results are. There is the result legend, so we can see what the maximum pressures are, the maximum velocities. And if I want, I can right click and play this. So this is in one location, but if I hit play, it takes that plane and moves it completely across the computational domain. All right, another option for results, a surface plot. So this one I'll just go ahead and show is a pressure plot on the entire vehicle, on the entire semi-truck.
ISO surfaces, this is kind of like a surface plot, but a 3D look to it. So if I just show that, you can see in the front the, there's this bubble. That's a, a pressure plot, kind of giving you some, some depth to how that looks. And then my favorite overall view of results, the flow trajectories. So again, it's right-click insert and filling out what you want to see. So there's different ways to view these trajectories, different options for placing them. So this one is picking a, a face, this front face, and setting up a bunch of points. Okay, and these points are where our trajectories are going to be located. You tell it what you want to see as a trajectory, so the appearance. So we've got flat arrows. You give it a size, the parameter, and again, the green check mark will show you just that. And of course, you can always play that so you can see the, the field streams, the flow trajectories in action. This next one, just another example. I'll just go ahead and show it. This one uses our little spheres. Looks like we need to crop that. You can, there's an option to crop your region so you're not looking at the entire computational domain. So that's part of your flow trajectories options. I'll just go ahead and hide that. And then finally, if you want more exact results, uh, results at exact locations, like at a point along a surface uh, through an entire volume, you can use those options to do just that. X, Y plots, if you want to know what the pressure is along the side of the trailer, you can draw a sketch, a single line, and the X, Y plot can use that line to extract results from, and you'll, you'll get from one end to the next, a pressure result every so many units or so, so many uh, inches or millimeters or however you want to set it up along that line. All right, and then finally, our goal plot. So the goals we created earlier, what are those results? Again, right-click insert. I'll just go ahead and add the definition to show the, the first goal is looking at the force, right? So that's the, the result that we see in our table. And that's what we want to see on each of the different uh, configurations. There is this drag force option. That is a simple formula that makes sure we're looking at positive values. So if you square it and then take the square root, uh, you're just ensuring that you're working uh, in and an absolute positive value. But it's still just the, the normal force. I can show it, I can export it to Excel if I want, but there you go, at the bottom, I can see that force, the average value, minimum, maximum, that it was used in conver convergence, it reached convergence or progression 100%, and yeah, there you go. And I think the other one that I've got here is just that for drag coefficient. Again, you hit show, and there's your drag coefficient for, for this uh, configuration. And that's it. So we did that uh, five different times. You can see the different studies, and we created our table. So how effective? What are, your, what are your thoughts? What are your answers with the fairing, the skirt, the tail? For me, I, I figured the fairing was going to be quite effective. I wasn't so sure about the skirt or tail. Well, here you go. So the drag force, the force on the semi-truck with all components, 682, with no fairing, 939. 
So that's a percent change of 38%, which is quite drastic. The other two, not so drastic. Without the skirt, a drag force of 746 pounds, a 9% change. Without the tail, 719 pounds, 6% change. So that's probably why we don't see skirts and tails on every semi truck that passes us. Uh, to be honest, I, I rarely see them. Once in a while, a skirt, and very rarely do I ever see a tail. But I have seen them and always wonder how effective are they. So there you go. That is our end result. 